Well, we're going to look at what happens to rock when it changes from solid to liquid. All divers know, all scuba divers, which I, I, I'm a scuba diver, everybody that's a scuba diver, you already know what I'm going to say. All of you that's ever been a submarine sailor, you're going to know what, I'm going to, what we're talking about, how density affects your buoyancy. Uh, so, what we're going to be explaining here is that that ball uh, that's wrapped by a Velcro sleeve that's hooked up to a diving weight, is, it is buoyant because its density is less than the water that it's sitting in. And if I push that ball down in that column of water, the pressure of the water column increases with depth. In fact, it's roughly speaking, for every two feet you go down in a column of water, you're going to increase the pressure on that ball one pound per square inch. So as that ball goes down, and keep going down, Jeff, as that ball goes down, and he's just pushing it down with a hook, and then he's going to let go. So let go. See, it's going to float up, and the, and the higher it gets, the faster it's going to flow up. So, but as he's pushing it down, the pressure is, is compressing the ball, which is increasing the density, decreasing the volume, and ultimately you would get at a depth, which we call crossover depth, where perfect neutral buoyancy is achieved, to where the weight and the ball together, because of the compression on that ball, increasing in density, losing in volume, there's going to be a depth where it's exactly the same density, the combined training aid is the same density as the water that is around it. And so then you let go, and it will stay almost right there, a little bit further down to the clip. And then, is what's, now just guess in your mind, what happens if you go a little bit below that? If you go a little bit below that, you're gonna compress that ball a little bit more, and now the density of the ball and weight are going to actually be combined more than the water surrounding it. The volume will decrease a little bit more, and pretty soon it's going to sink to the bottom. And the further down it goes, the faster it goes. Does everybody see that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, thanks, Jeff. That is really important. Not as important as knowing Jesus, but <laughs> that is going to be important for our little discussion from here on. So, now a little bit more science class. Earth's radius is about 4,000 miles. The mantle thickness is about 1,800 miles. And you'll notice this crossover depth. That crossover depth, as far as melted rock is concerned is the same as right at our, the middle of our demonstration there. That is going to be the density of melted rock. When rock goes from solid to liquid, that's the place where it's neutral buoyant. It doesn't want to go up or go down. But if, if rock melts below that, the resultant liquid magma rock wants to only go down. The rock above that, when it melts, it wants to go up, just like that ball. Okay, and this line we're going to find out is 220 miles into the earth, crossover depth. And then we have, you know, the crust on the outside, mantle, liquid core, center, solid core of the earth. Now, the Japanese secular scientists were the ones that were doing research on the melting of mantle minerals under pressure. They were studying what happens to minerals that we melt under extreme pressures in the earth to try and understand the inner earth. They were the ones that came up with this graph in 2006 in an in a, uh, article they published as anomalous compression of basaltic magma. This is their research paper. Dude, this, Christians didn't come up with this. Creationists didn't come up with this. Uh, the core mantle boundary is about 1,800 miles deep. The crossover depth is 220 miles, again that dotted line. This is the density line for solid rock as you go deeper. So how does density change as you go deep? Now watch this line grow, that's what's happening. The deeper you go, 
and you'll see that this, this is density. The further you go to the right, the more dense the, uh, you know, the rock is. But rock that changes state to liquid is called magma, and as soon as rock melts and turns into magma, this is the density line that governs magma. So let's consider what happens at 100 miles. 100 miles deep, which is in the mantle, but above the crossover depth. You have Joe Rock is sitting there minding his own business until one day an earthquake happens. And when the earthquake happens, right next to that rock, the, the slippage along the fault line is going to melt this, this piece of rock. What's it going to do? Well, it's still 100 miles deep, so it's going to melt into magma, and it's going to go left on that density line over to the liquid line. That's what it's going to do. So when it moved over to the left, it became bigger. See, the red dot is bigger than the black dot. Its volume increased. So just like that ball, it's going to go from being here to bigger and going to want to float up. Does everybody follow that, I hope? And so as the rock melted at 100 miles deep, its density increased, its volume, its density decreased, and its volume increased. From, from that day on, that magma is trying to find its way to the top. Magma will ascend at all depths above 220 miles by the laws of physics. This is so important. Mantle shift due to compression. See that as that bubble grows, it's pushing mantle around as it's lifting up and crust, creating earthquakes. You know, I, I want to just summarize here at this point. Earthquakes have more to do with the expansion and contraction of magma. That's what earthquakes are coming from. The, the effects of magma as it changes in elevation, what happens to its volume as it changes in elevation, and the stresses it produces in the crust and the deep mantle of the earth. So, again, just as an emphasis, crossover depth. Notice that the two lines cross. So everybody see that? They cross. That means that when rock melts at the crossover depth, it doesn't change in volume at all. It doesn't produce any stress. It doesn't want to go up. It doesn't want to go down. That's why there's very few earthquakes at 220 miles. Again, this is actual hard data. Number of earthquakes with depth in the Earth. Notice there's a lot of earthquakes up high. That's because as that ball gets towards the surface, it's wanting to grow more and more and more as it gets to the surface. As the ball gets closer and closer to the crossover depth, any melting that's happening there, it's not really putting that buoyant force to try and split rock and cause things, so there's a lot less earthquakes at the crossover depth, the 220. And then as you go down, there's more and more earthquakes until you reach another peak at around 400 miles deep, and then they go away because there's so much pressure at 400 miles that things move like putty instead of fracturing along fault lines. Again, this is all explained in Dr. Brown's book in greater detail. So, below the crossover depth, the pressure is so extreme that rock will decrease in volume, increase in density when it melts. So now I'm going from big as a solid rock to smaller as a liquid rock. Therefore, magma cannot emphasize that this is an emphasis that, that plate tectonics is wrong. Magma cannot ascend from depths below 220 miles. And they say that. The Japanese paper concludes, this is a concluding statement in their paper. The basaltic magma could not ascend from a position deeper than 200 kilometers, which is even less than 200 miles. And that was their analysis of one of the minerals. When you put all the minerals together, we know from the earthquake data that it's, it's more accurate to say 220 miles. They, they said 200 kilometers, which is less than 200 miles. <laughs> 